<laughs> hey, everyone, I'm Clint Gatewood here at SASMAX, and I'm going to be your host here today. So just hang on. we got uh, a lot of people, a lot of great people registered from all over the world. So uh, we're going to give them a few more moments. Uh, I'll be back in about a minute, uh, to 30 seconds or so, and we'll get started. So hang on and uh, get ready for a fantastic show. Be back with you shortly. All right, I'm back. So I'm Clint Gatewood here at uh, SASMAX. So thank you for coming to the webinar today. Uh, wherever you're wherever you're hailing from, we've got people all over the globe that are joining us today. I'm again I'm Clinton Gatewood. I'm hosting uh, today's event. I got that's so we got some really good speakers for you today. And uh, so we're gonna move right along. A lot of great content. And uh, if I talk too much, we're not gonna get to everybody else. So I want to start out now. I, I will introduce Alaz Gonzalez. He's a chief strategy officer at Ziff Solutions. Who we joined us? I'm going to let him introduce himself real briefly. Hey, Laz. Hey, Clint. How you doing? Uh, great to join you. Awesome. Thanks for letting me be on this fantastic webinar with Stuart. Um, and thanks for everybody for for joining us. As Clint mentioned, my name is Laz Gonzalez, and um, I'm the chief strategy officer for Zip Solutions, the developer of enterprise channel management tools. So everything you need to run your channel program. Uh, before I did this, which was about five years ago since I've been at Zift, uh, I was um, the head of research for channel management strategies at Serious Decisions, later to become Forrester. And so I did that for a long time, worked with some fantastic people, had visibility into over 200 supplier programs, fantastic. Um, and I'm also a practitioner, so I'm probably older than you think, but um, uh, I was a practitioner for 20 years, so ran a couple of channel programs myself and understand some of the, the trials and tribulations out there. I'm glad to join you guys and share whatever I can to make this valuable. Great, Laz, great to have you. And Stuart Crawford, uh, I'll let Stuart introduce himself, CEO of Realistic. Uh, I've known Stuart for a very, very long time. Actually, he was a channel partner of mine back when I ran channels at Xenoth Tech, and we did a lot of work together in the past, and uh, but that's been a while ago. So Stuart, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, uh, Clint. Yeah, that seems like, does it definitely seems like a long time ago. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Stuart Crawford, and I mentioned I'm the CEO at Ulistic. We are a digital marketing agent, agency that specializes in working with IT service organizations, uh, providing web uh, site uh, development, SEO, uh, pay-per-click management, and uh, a, a little bit of marketing and sales coaching for those that are struggling to uh, close business. So I like to say that we're the bartender for MSPs in the digital space. Great, fantastic. And we've had one person that said hello, uh, uh, Alan Marston said he remembers you from uh, being up in Alberta. So, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> to fantastic, great. Well, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping here, just real quick on what else on the agenda. So, some of the uh, the ground rules uh, here today for for what we're doing is that you're all going to be on mute. Uh, there's just way too many of you to to really open up the mics and talk. So, uh, at any point in time. Uh, just go ahead and type in your questions, just like uh, Alan did earlier, and giving a shout out to Stuart. If you want to give a shout out to the rest of us, please do. Uh, happy to have them as well. But as we're going through, go ahead and type in your questions. I am watching those questions. So if they're really, really pertinent to the information we're talking about at that time, I will cover them. So please don't don't hesitate to put your questions in. Uh, it would be really great to have those. So uh, we'll be talking today about uh, ideal partners and how to sell your ideal partners and. Uh, why you should treat your partners like leads will be, be a section that we're going to be covering uh, planning the relationship and how that impacts the long-term uh, alignment and performance that your partners will have with you over over that lifetime. And uh, as Stuart said, I've been, I've been friends with Stuart like for the last 20 years, basically. Uh, but that, that really started out uh, with a, a channel relationship that we had. Uh, partners you're looking for long-term and what matrices you can use to track some of that success. So, um, Really, when you get down to looking at an ideal 
what is the definition of an ideal partner? What does an ideal partner profile really begin to look like? Uh, and what does it really mean to you? And, and we'll be discussing some of that today, but it's really a partner that has the expertise and they can demonstrate that expertise uh, that they can work with your products, your solutions. They have, they're selling other solutions and they have the other right solutions that would either, they're either competitive, which still makes them a good partner if you can bring them on, or if they're an adjacent and they're selling adjacent solutions and products and uh, also the right business model. You really want to have your business model aligned from a financial perspective and how you're all making money uh, to make it a successful relationship. That's one of the places that will kill you real quick. Um, and they have the right customers. Are they selling? What are your buyer personas? And you want them to pretty much have the same type of buyer personas uh, that you're going after. You want to have that match. You want to be able to drive them. Or at least from your channel program that you have a, a business model for the customers that you can design it for just for them. In case, uh, you know, if you're selling to enterprise, you want them to sell to small businesses, you still have to have that. You, you still have to understand how that all works in the channel program. Um, I know they're great to work with, you know, it's going to be fun with you as well. But great to work with in that they're dedicated, uh, but they're also not, not going to be problem children at the same time. Uh, and they're driving revenue to you. And in many cases, that's because you're also driving revenue to them. Uh, but I know that uh, both uh, both my guests wanted to speak a little bit to this slide. So, uh, Laz, do you want to do you want to start off and speak a little bit about uh, your definition or, or how do you help define with what you do what an ideal partner is? Well, I mean, I'll start uh, and 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 you said it right. Uh, all those criteria are really really important, and you should think about you know who you want to do business with and what qualifications they have. But you know, I am floored by the lack of rigor in many supplier programs who don't have this defined. They have a good idea of one of the two things that you mentioned, like they might go after the partners of an adjacent solution and say, those are my partners. But I mean, if they were bad for the other guy, maybe they're bad, they're gonna be bad for you, right? So <laughs> I, I think the first thing that gets me is, you know, the lack of uh, really having, a, not just understanding and defining, but socializing what an ideal partner is. So I think that's huge. and. And the last point you raise here, which is driving revenue, um, I think you kind of touched on it when you said something to the effect of you got to understand their business model and that that's aligned. Um, you know, if you're selling a cloud solution, um, you don't have time to wait for a partner to convert their business and pay their people and do all of those things the right way to align with your business. I mean, when it comes to renewal, it'll be a nightmare. So you want to know from a revenue standpoint, you know, when I set a goal of X amount ARR, you know, per year or per period, whatever that is, that that's the same language they use, right? That that's something that they understand really well. And, you know, one thing here that saying that to big partners and small partners is really different. And, and I think Stuart has a couple of things to say about, you know, how you really do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Stuart? Yeah, thank, yeah, thanks guys for uh, throwing it over. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm gonna kind of, put it from the side of the partner and what we're looking for in, our, in an ideal in an ideal partnership with a vendor or a solution that we need to add to our uh, solution stack. So just like the, the vendors and the partners are looking for the ideal MSP or IT service company or reseller or system integrator to mold into your offering, we're looking at it from the same spec, you know, is, you know, can, do we have the opportunity here to make some serious revenue and fill, a, and fill a void in what we're offering as a solution and do our clients have a need for a solution like that? And, you know, and ultimately, you know, when it comes down to technologies, you know, most technologies are gonna be about the same with, you know, plus or minus a few differences here and there, but overall, you know, they're, they're the same. And I kind of the last point on this slide that really drives home for me as a, as a solution provider, is how are you going to help me make money? How are you going to help me have a lifestyle? And and that's what I look at it from a, from the from the partner side is, you know, how how are you going to help me drive revenue, build a business, or are you just going to expect me to go out there with no life jacket to uh, to go on my own? And and that's that's often that's you know not, not, and that's often the case that we see with a lot of uh, you know partner to vendor relationships. Is that okay? I signed up. What next? You're just going to push the pull and make you swim, Stuart. Try it. <laughs> uh, I've seen that before. So it, it doesn't work all that well. So uh, let me get over here. 
wow, my change, my slides weren't changing. I just went through like three of them. So you have to bear with me just one moment if I can try and get these uh, slides back up. So, um, and from our perspective too, from, from SASMAX, you know, when you're looking for those right partners, you're trying to identify them. Uh, it hasn't been something that, that, that's been readily available out there. It's very sketchy uh, uh, of what has been out there, but with Partner Optimizer and other things like Seth Davis and my, what uh, uh, Stuart's doing as well, you really now can really identify and, and quantify what a partner is and what partners you need to invest in much more quickly. You, you really have that type of, of capability now with a lot of the data solutions that are out there. From our perspective, when we're looking at, you know, who's a partner in our proprietary data that we're pulling is really understanding uh, the actual insights insofar as what the partner personas are, what they're made up of, their company types like we talked about, the solutions and services they're providing overall, the product types they're working with, the customers they focus on, additional qualifications and tech stacks, and really bringing that into a very consumable way that you you don't have to spend a lot of time doing a lot of research or spending huge amounts of money just to, to find out some of these things, where you get it all in one place and really bring that profile together, which I think that these things that we have here, what I believe from running my own channel programs is, this is really the cornerstone data that you've got to have this foundation to understand who these partners are, to then start to use a lot of other data sets that are out there and, and data pieces like, like your uh, different data sets to use, sorry. I uh, lost my train of thought there. But as we move into looking at uh, treating partners like leads and, and now you know who these, these companies are and how you're going to reach out to them and start to work with them, um, so I think that in practice, we start off with you, Laz, on this one. So we'll also start with you here. And as Laz is talking to some of the slide here, we're going to throw up a poll. So uh, take, a, take a few moments to, to look at the poll and fill it out. I just launched it. So go ahead and fill it out. And Laz, do you want to speak to, uh, you know, treating your partners like leads and what does this mean to you? Yeah, I mean, um, it's the opposite of uh, one and done, right? Like, uh, I think... I think you have to kind of put it all in perspective and, and Stuart from a marketing agency's perspective I'm sure you, sh you you share this view with me is that if you're going after um, customers um, you want to know everything you can about them and you're not necessarily going to make them an offer um, the the first moment that you see them you want to nurture that relationship you know to the poll question do you you know what companies are nurturing what who has a plan out there with existing partners well, a lot of the, a lot of companies don't like they'll make them an offer and they'll you know have a shotgun message and I almost say they take like a spray and pray approach. Whereas I really think that if you treat partners like leads, you're looking at the the companies. You're thinking about you know which ones am I going to ask to join me in this, uh, whether it be a campaign or a training session or whatever it is. And then you're you're making them offers and, and you aren't going to necessarily make them the killer offer at the very end, right? Whether they're new or they're just joining your program, right? Um, you want to make them an offer that they can identify with. So, um, you know, Stuart mentioned before that as a company and a partner, they want to succeed. You know, they want to know when, how am I going to make the revenue? So, you know, when you make them an offer and, and you're thinking about that, you know, it's going to sound something like, you know, a road to revenue for the partner. And you're going to show them the steps that you plan to take with them. And so when you're treating them like leads, you're kind of breaking it down into almost like a sales funnel, but it's almost like an engagement funnel, right? And and here what we've done is we've taken some of the industry best practices and created at Ziff Solutions our own best practices on driving engagement. And the idea is that you know you bring partners into your program, and up, up until then they're they're prospects, right? If they're they could be prospects that you don't work with or they could be prospects that have signed up to your program and you're asking them to join you in some kind of in initiative. Whatever the case is, you should have a layer of qualification. So for instance, if, you're, if you've got an offer for FedGov and you want you know, those partners that are selling into governments to participate, you're using that data that you captured to target the right partners to go after, right? And then you make them the offer and you know, the offer should have value in it, right? It should, it should show them how they win. So, Hey, um, if you join us in this marketing activity in, in the FedGov sector, know that you know we're gonna we're gonna ask you to join this advisory board, and then you know any leads coming out of this, you're gonna go back your way, you know. So set the rules, right? Let them know. And so the the offer, the education, and then the engagement is really where the rubber meets the road, because at this point they've now said yes, I'm going with you on this, and now I want to know what I need to know 
and I want to do it. And I think this is where most channel programs fall apart at the bottom half of this funnel. Um, you know, they kind of paint the picture, they make the offer, but it's like Stuart said, they go, oh, well, here it is. Uh, you know, go, go off to yourself and do whatever you can. And I think that's the missing piece, right? If you think about these as stages, you can say, hey, maybe at the education and engagement stage, I want to have like a concierge in there, somebody who touches that partner right after they learn what they needed to learn. And then I'm going to tell them, hey, now that you've learned that, here's how you can put those skills into action, you know? So I think what's interesting about this, uh, not only is to get them down to the final stage, which is the productivity stage where they're actually putting up business, is if anything goes wrong, I think channel programs have a tendency to you know, throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, right? They'll try to just, oh, let's try something new. And I, I think that that's really painful from a partner's perspective. You know, It's like, what are you doing? What's coming at me? I feel like if you take a model like this, you can see where the breakdowns are. So if you're not getting the engagement after you train them, maybe it's time to put that concierge in there, right? Uh, if you're not getting enough hand raisers when you make them an offer to join, Maybe you should think about the messaging. There's something wrong there. So I feel like treating partners like leads is just like treating customers like leads, right? And and having a nurture plan to kind of go through all of this and avoid the, you know, the one and done or the spray and pray where, you know, you're just shooting in the dark. So I, I think this is a really great model for companies to follow. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really great uh, partner journey that you, that you put forward here. And so far, something to do with your customer journey, right? And how you move those forward. And I know you had a lot of strong feelings about this too, uh, Stuart, because um, you know, when I look at, just real briefly to, to transition to, to Stuart here, is that I really look at, if you know who these partners are as you're bringing them forward and you recruit the right ones, you know, because don't get that 80% bad ones, you know, make sure all of them are going to do some type of producers, get that, get that right company to work with in the first place with, through that ideal partner profile and or persona. And then as you're bringing them through this whole journey, now you can really look at it and say, where are we getting stuck? Where are we not, where is it not happening for us? We know we brought the right partners in. Uh, and Stuart, I know that you have a, you, you wanted to, you know, to really talk about that as well and, and engagement, what they need to do to really work with partners as well. So I'll turn it over to Stuart. Yeah, thanks, uh, Clinton. That allows you to make some good points there too. And again, uh, I'll flip it around from the other side just so everybody you know, understands the, you know, the way the solution provider thinks is you're you're qualifying them as leads or prospects as like a normal sales funnel would look like but also remember that they're qualifying you uh do you fit again you fit into their solution stack do you have uh you know do you offer you know things that can make them provide a better level of service for your clients and keep this in mind that the average solution provider is getting pitched anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen times per day from vendors and and solution uh, solutions out there, you know, being the smallest, uh, you know, solution, the, the latest RMM tool or whatever, uh, to you know, to some big players like the IBM, Microsofts uh, of the world, they're getting uh, their mailboxes and sales lines are flooded just as much. So if to re and as I teach my MSP clients, you know, if you're going out prospecting for new business, law firms or medical offices you really have to make yourself stand out what what is it about you that's going to make somebody stop and say oh i should really look at this and i always tell managed service providers and they're very much guilty of this is you know in any other business model 99 percent of them are all saying the same thing expecting different results and i look at it the way that the vendor community works as well is that yeah. if you really want to stand out understand my business and 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 ask me the questions of where my you know where my voids are and what more can i be doing or again demonstrate up front that i have you have a solution that's going to make my life easier and make my, my clients lives easier and it's going to be something that they actually want to get and then going through the funnel uh, you know is you know yeah as i mentioned earlier you want to educate them uh, engage with them you know i uh I, I had a way when I was running my solution provider business out in Calgary, uh, Alberta, and hello to Alan. I remember us pounding the, you know, pounding the networking events out in Calgary many, many years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, we had a, you know, we had a methodology of, you know, we were also responsible for driving engagement 
with our vendor partners. And I can get into that now, or I can talk about, I think I can talk about a little more later what our methodology was. But, you know, I, as a vendor partner of yours, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't satisfied with the odd email or, or phone call once a, once a year. I really wanted engagement. And I, you know, my best solution provider partners, you know, were educating me, they were engaging and they were helping me produce. So I think from a, you know, from this funnel here is you really want to understand, you know, who your best partners are for engagement and, and really, in, uh, what's the word I'm looking at, cultivate that relationship where, you know, and, 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 and work with them so they can produce even more. Once they have a recipe of success, investing more time with it is going to amplify that. Hey, and Stuart, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, you know, this is the supplier's view, right? So this is what the supplier is trying to do. There's a parallel track here, which is that partner's journey, right? And, you know, when, when, you're, when they're the prospect, when you're this prospect stage, you know, they're asking as many questions as you're asking, right? They're, what's in it for me? How do we earn business? What are you asking in terms of commitment? So I think that partner's journey point that you made is really important. Yeah, and I think lastly, you know, you know, there's a we have we had an old saying that we say there's only one radio station that matters, WW or WIFM. What's in it for me, right? Uh, as a solution provider, that's what I'm looking for. I don't. You can have the best product in the world, but it doesn't fit my business model. I, you know, I always tell the story about Rolex watches. You know, when I go to the, when I go to the Caribbean, we were talking about traveling. You know, earlier on, you know, I used to go to the Caribbean. People would try to sell me Rolex watches, but I don't wear a watch. So it could be the cheapest Rolex watch. I'm still not going to buy it because I have no need for it. And that, you, and that I think the biggest mistake that vendor partners make selling to the solution provider industry is they they think that the world has a demand for this. There's a need for it, and you may be true, but the solution provider doesn't understand. It. Then that's when they don't return your phone call or engage because they don't really understand how this is going to help their business. Good point. Okay, great. Let's, let's move on to the next slide now. Someone's, uh, we still have the polls up. I, mean, I don't know why they're not turning off. Um, so I hope everyone's back to the regular presentation here. We talked about how yeah. important is planning. Um, so uh, do you want to start with this one, uh, Stuart? So sorry, a little off uh, off base because I'm not sure why the poll won't close down. But Stuart, do you want to go ahead and start uh, on you know, how important is for planning? Because what I see is the uh, three partners like lead slide. What do you see? I see that treat partners like leads. I haven't hasn't refreshed on my end. Okay, so yeah, we're talking about how important is planning. So you see that? No, we don't see it yet. Yeah, I don't know what else happened. Now I got the poll. Yeah, I'm gonna try and hide that and get rid of it. There you go. And then share back. Here we go. I think we're almost there. I see what's going on. Now maybe it'll be the wrong screen. There we go. Now we got. Now we just got them reversed. Now we see your. Now we see your presentation screen. Oh wow! Why did it? I don't know why it turned off my sharing. So, but there you go. That'll be, that'll be an interesting video for later to watch. <laughs> so well, what, a, what a segue into planning, right? <laughs> exactly. Planning. planning. We need to think about it. Uh, <laughs> We planned all we wanted for this, and it's still it's still had technical issues. That's just how yeah, it goes, exactly. right? So, anyways, let's but, talk about planning, Stuart. Do you want to kick off on this one? Well, you know, there, so from the solution provider side, um, you know, I, I mean, I can only share my own experiences. So I'll share how I did things uh, back in my day as a solution provider, and I think it's, I still think it's relevant today. Um, there's there's lots of opportunities for you as a as a vendor. Um, slash channel partner, uh, supplier to, you know, plan with stuff like people like me. So, you know, one of the things that I, and that I highly recommended that every partner that we work with from Microsoft, right to distribution partners, right down to local suppliers. If it was a, you know, a, my website guy or my printer uh, company, they used to have to do printing service. We would hold an annual two day uh, workshop uh, that we hosted, uh, people would fly in or travel in uh, to it every year in Calgary. Um, we'd try to do it in around the stampede times and make it worthwhile for people to come in. But 
we did it we did it and we that was our annual plan we brought all of our ch channel partners together and we said okay here's our vision for the future uh here's what we want to get to how can we all work together and what we saw was what we experienced was something very magical so we would have sonicwell who was our firewall vendor at the time working with tech data and then microsoft working with sonicwall and actually shortel who's our VoIP provider and sonicwall working together and they all started putting these solutions together with each other to benefit us so from a planning perspective from a solution provider that was you know very very important for us but from from us to the vendor as well outside of that our best our best relationships were with the ones that took the time to do an annual or quarterly plan with us and really just help us under and ask the question so where do we want to take our business and how can we help you get there so that's uh for me that you know planning is a definitely a two-way street we're going to show you as our solution uh, as our solution provider because the roles are reversed you're i'm the partner and you're my solution provider um you know to help us meet, meet our goals and then um and then there was another part of it too with our clients that got involved but i won't go there today but you know you know having uh things like advisor councils and partner roundtables and then one-on-one -on -one planning and interaction you know as a as a as a vendor partner that's what i want i want engagement you know i want you to be uh you know and i said i still do that in my business today with our crm and our other tools that we use in, at ulistic i still have very interactive relationship with my uh with my up, upstream providers and uh, it's very very important for us to have that and help us get our business we're providing the right solution for the end cu customer which is you know my customers are your customers so that's uh that's uh, you know that's important to us so i'll, I'll whip it over to Lazar or clint whoever wants to pick it up from here i mean I, uh, um I, I love the knowledge bombs you're dropping stuart <laughs> you know it's uh i think it's like awesome. really going to you Laz. so go right ahead no but i i think what's important and i i, I hope the audience is appreciating this because um, I'm certainly focused on the supplier world and Stuart's giving us, here's what it feels like from a partner side of things. I think that's fantastic. Sometimes it's just one or the other. And I, I like the way that we're mixing it here. Um, I, I don't disagree with Stuart at all. And by, by the way, this sounds like, watch it like that NBA thing where the guys are arguing a point, but <laughs> um, I don't disagree with Stuart at all. Uh, and I know that the partners want you to show them the love but as a supplier, you can't show everybody the love the same way, right? Uh, the event is fantastic. I think that's, fan that's a great idea. And that's why if you went to the partner conferences, you would see the uh, planning booths, right? So the sales guys would usher you into these small little tables in the white booths set across in that empty ballroom. And what's this all about? And it was where, you know, hey, we kick off the planning at our big event. So I'm all for that. What's really hard, is uh, uh, applying the plan the planning process to everyone in the most effective way right you know you've got your big partners they could be disties they could be master agents they could be you know uh dmrs like the cdws of the world and you know they are just not going to sit down <laughs> and go through the kind of planning that you want them to uh, maybe they will if you've got mind share but if you don't it's a struggle and you know those are the big partners then you got the small partners who you know you know can't pl can't spell plan backwards and i don't mean that in a bad way it's just that they're not used to it and their planning is different now Stuart, you said some things there that i hope our audience did not miss the idea that you have tools as a partner that you use to flow back and forth communications with your provider and i think that that's really important one thing we've done at Zift, right, to facilitate that is create a series of CRM connectors for all the types of different CRM tools out there. So that when a supplier needs visibility into pipelines, we're having a conversation with that partner and saying, look, it's not all the information. They don't need names and emails. What they want to know is how much pipeline you got and how what's the growth on it and so on. And that's the information we'll be passing back and forth. So those tools are really, really important. And it's really good for smaller partners, right, that already are using something to keep, keep keep track of stuff. But I feel like if you're looking for an example, like the question that you have here, what does the planning process really look like? 
you know, it depends what you're planning for, right? Uh, there is no immaculate conception. So leads are just not going to start popping out of thin air, right? You have to plan for that. You have to plan for creating that demand, making sure that these partners are trained and enabled, and then executing. And I feel like if, if you're looking to develop leads, right, you're creating demand, you're gonna have to sit down with them and understand how they create demand. Because your solution might be just a small subset of their solution. You know, they're fulfilling a much broader tech stack than what you're fulfilling. And you know, whereas you know, your product is important, but it only represents a small fraction of what the customer is gonna spend with them, you should know what that ASP is. You should also know how long it takes them to sell it, what's the sales cycle length, and how many people buy it. Are there five people involved? Is there one person involved? Um, with this kind of information, you can create the right demand generation campaign, right? It's the difference between selling a, a switch uh, that you need to buy within 24 hours when it breaks and a security software that you know might cost you six figures and seven people get involved, right? That's the difference. And this one you nurture, this one you become more inbound and transactional. And for the big partners, you have to ask those questions. I'll, I'll, I'll digress one more, one more time here and talk about the small partners, right? The volume partners. And there, you don't have the, um, the resources, at least most programs don't have the resources, Stuart, and I'm sorry, to show that love at the individual level to a large number of small partners. So they have to generalize. They have to kind of think about these guys and say, okay, what can I tell about them that would help me provide the right types of uh, you know, demand tools for them to go out there and, and generate? And you're gonna find that it's at the difference between you know, eating at a fancy restaurant versus serving up McDonald's meals. Those meals are gonna get consumed, but you have to think about what they're gonna eat, right? And for example, you might say, all right, if I have a target a list of partners, let's say 100, right? and I wanna go after some new business and I wanna also leverage their existing business, maybe one of the things I might need to know is which one of these guys has customer lists and is willing to share it, right? So if they've got that and I can explain to them why we're gonna use it, we can do an account-based marketing program with them. I'm not saying that you're gonna run it with them, but you're gonna set up a program that maybe you, know, you upload your list and then it does you know, certain, hey, I'm back, I'm representing this company now, I'd like to set up an exploratory. You know, the customer that you know is three times more likely than the customer you don't know, so you're better off making a good impression using data. And if they've got list data that can help you, that's how you wanna do it with those types. But then maybe there's another type that won't give you the list. And they don't wanna sell this to old customers, they wanna open up new customers. So for those guys, you might have to take a look at their websites and see, you know, hey, who's ready for some inbound traffic here? Because I could go create demand on the web by creating campaigns and so on and drive that traffic. But if the partner doesn't have a good website, you know, the lead falls dead on its, eel, on its, on its ears, right? So what you want to make sure is that, you know, you take into consideration these kind of generalities of the smaller partners that are that are important, right? And I'm not saying make this up. I'm talk to partners, find out, you know, what shape, do a website audit, see who's got what, right? And then use that at the planning stage for the smaller partners. So I think the big takeaway is, you know, uh, this is not a one size fits all approach. You have to think about who's on the other end and take those planning steps with them together. And the more you know about them, the better off I think your end result will be. So can I uh, I'll, can I just make a counterpoint to Lazar? And I, I agree 100% with everything you said. From the smaller uh, partner perspective, uh, we want we want the love and uh, we want the love of the big partner. But when we and we really don't understand that you have limited bandwidth. We expect you have you know you know that that's the way we feel. So um, what I would recommend is this is where peer groups and peer uh, organizations really come into play is if you can latch onto a peer group we have some at Ulistic where you know we, we used to get together once a quarter until COVID hit but you know we would bring in we would bring in somebody uh like a partner rep to come and talk to us for an afternoon and do planning with us as a group and I know Clint and I used to run in a lot of peer groups at one time and it was very beneficial uh for that so you bring in you bring a number of your small partners together into one setting and then attack them all at once that's one way around that is, and they feel, and they get the love. The second 
point I have for Laz is he said something very profound. What 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 do you mean leads are not like leads are not like the Immaculate Conception there, Laz? They, they don't fall out of anywhere because my clients think leads just come out of other space. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, guy. you know the this as guy. much as I do. It's really hard to get a partner to engage in a lead developing activity. And so you got to show them, look, I, look at it this way. Now, post COVID, right? You've got a, a, a digital, a wave of digital transformation taking place. Uh, you as a provider cannot go knock on somebody's door and take them out to lunch. I mean, you can meet them there, but you can't go to the company because nobody's there. And if you did, you know, it, it probably wouldn't get done what you used to do, right? So now all these partners are kind of saying, well, how do I keep the lifeline going? How do I keep in touch? How do I keep top of mind? And this is where I think the digital transformation comes in. So I think before you get them to, you know, find that lead, you got to tell them why this is important and kind of hammer that home. So no argument from me, just, you know, they just don't show up for anywhere. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to have to move on here too. So we get, we're going to have a commercial break here if we're not careful uh, yeah. coming up. But uh, yeah, we're going to have to move on. But I, a great conversation. Um, I think too, when you look at the important planning, and, and you you take it from perspective of size of clients, and 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 Stuart's looking at it from the solution provider, why can't you spend time with me? And there are some mismatches there, but I think is from from a supplier side and a vendor side, you know, especially on there is like when you find those ideal partners, and you can really, and sometimes they change just a little bit within your with with what you're doing is that depending on the program that you're pushing out there, but those are the ones that are really going to sit with you and they're going to plan, but you need to know who they are. And like Stuart had mentioned, know who we are when you when you come and approach us so that you can approach us in the right manner. Uh, there's no sense of us. They don't want to start a relationship down the road where it's a mismatch too. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier, too many times you're recruiting the wrong partners. So if nothing else, what you do is get yourself a good ideal uh, partner profile, find those partners and, and find those first and bring them ones on. Uh, anything else you can bring on outside of that is is good. You can bring your to work through them and see if they really are going to fit your plan. Um, that you're moving forward with. So first and foremost, get those Glen Gary leads and, and, and make sure you're moving forward with them because you know that they're going to you know, have that capability to really match with you moving forward. Um, forgot to take that one out, but all on one side. So we've got uh, just a few moments here left on this. If you have questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in. I did have a couple more polls for you to use uh, or to share with you, but uh, I didn't admit that last one to work right, so I'm a little gun shy of that. we got a lot to talk about. But if you have questions, please put them in. I'm not sure how much time we're going to have. We'll be done here in about five minutes. But uh, I did want to cover this slide uh, being ROI one-sided. And uh, Stuart, I'm going to start with, I think I did start with you last time. So uh, Laz, do you want to just uh, uh, briefly here, but, uh, but yet concisely? All right. So ROI, right? Is it one-sided? Um, you know, ROI is like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Everybody's looking for the Ark of the Covenant. You know, where's the <laughs> ROI? I don't think that it's one-sided. I just think we're all going about it the wrong way. Uh, it it's almost feels to me that when a supplier is um, looking for ROI in their program, first of all, they don't know where to start, right? They, do I count people? Do I count technology? Do I count service agencies? You know, where's where's my investment? So you need a good model. You need a good ROI model. I've seen a couple. Uh, the tread model that serious decisions developed a couple of years ago actually was a financial model. It's a great way to track things, but you need a way of tracking things. Then you have to kind of say, I cannot expect to get the ROI after the fact. In other words, if I'm going to create, a, if I'm going to enlist these partners, and then I'm going to create some demand with them, and we're going to build a pipeline, and then I'm going to track those leads. You know, I have to be really premeditated about that. I cannot like just do the campaign over here, do the training over there, and then come the end of the quarter, try to figure out what closed and what caused it to close, right? That's when you give Stuart that annoying call, hey, what's in the pipeline? Uh, you know, wh what are you gonna bring in this quarter, right? These guys don't appreciate that, and I don't mean to speak for you, but you know, I've been there and, I think it's a lot more uh, beneficial to the partner if you have a process and you're working with them along the way and you're not playing Sherlock Holmes trying to find, you know, that missing ROI. So those are my thoughts. 
Yeah, so yeah, that was great, Stuart. You know, I'm going to keep it as short and quick to, as possible, knowing that we're getting short on time. In the vendors' eye, on the partners' eyes, all we care about is business growth revenue. You know, how are you going to help me drive revenue, and how are you going to help me provide a better level of service to my clients? So indirectly, they end up paying us more for our services or buy future services from us. Nothing worse in a partner's eye that investing in a great new solution and then flopping and then losing a client because your technology failed and that wasn't my fault. So uh, it goes back to the old saying is that, uh, you know, uh, make it work, help me make money, and, uh, and I better not lose any clients because of it. <laughs> No, exactly. So you don't mind that annoying call at the end of the quarter. <laughs> no, we talked about that. You know, we talked about that yesterday, guys. Is that the old thing was you never get fired for IBM, right? Or you know, at the worst case scenario, you put a, win a patch on a Windows Server and it blue screened. Now you today you have a whole bunch of other risk factors in there, like a, mon a network monitoring tool that gets hacked with ransomware and then spreads ransomware to all your clients. That's a business-ending event. You know, at the MSP, or the server wasn't at fault for. Just, that's that's what they're that's what they're nervous about and ROI is part of that discussion. Yeah. Good point. Exactly, exactly. So I'm not gonna belabor this point. I think you both uh, put it out there really well. Uh, I do think at, at times the, the supplier side, the vendor side, uh, doesn't realize that they're being uh, uh, interviewed during that process of, of, of coming in and bringing a partner on. They're also interviewing you. Do they wanna work with you? So it is it is about that relationship and, and the joint sharing within the fruits of that. and when problems happen, you know, raise your hand and let's take care of them and let's move forward and let's be, uh, you know, make sure we're all making money together. And that's really what uh, chain relationships are. Um, so as we continue on, we're, we're kind of towards the end here. Uh, lessons learned from a partner lifetime, one size fits all, fish cut bait, our sales all there. Uh, we really didn't get down through this, uh, this particular slide. Um, Stuart, anything you want to you want to just really capture here before we before we move on? Yeah, probably lots of things that go on here, Clint. But uh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna kind of uh, from you know what again re reinforce from the partner from the partner side or the vendor side of the sorry the solution provider side is you know uh, just as much as you're qualifying us, we're qualifying you. And uh, if we're not getting what we want from a from a partner, there's other solutions out there that we make, you know, that we can engage with. And uh, you know, uh, and and sales is not the only thing that we're looking for. We're not looking for new sales all the time. We're looking for education, uh, you know, technical, uh, you know, knowledge. We're looking for a lot of things. And uh, you know, and and at the end of the day, we want somebody to be there. We want reassurance that you have our backs. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking for. You know, ultimately, is from a partner perspective, we want somebody that we can go to battle together with. And uh, you know, when, when the you know what hits the fan, we're not going to be left hanging high and dry. Right. Last. Um, you're only as good as your channel account manager. Uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of suppliers have fantastic programs. They have all these resources. But what the the partner feels is that single point of contact. And if they're not good, if they're new, if they don't understand the partner's business, for all the reasons above, you're not gonna be successful. So I think uh, one understated point is that you need to enable your channel account managers to do their job. Uh, as much as you think about enabling partners, find out what you know, what you need to know, and make sure that you take into the partner's considerations as well. And if I can yeah, add one course. thing to that, yeah, so, go ahead. If I can add one story, is that from on what on Laz's point about the channel account managers, as a leader in as a leader of your organization or department, reach out to your partners and find out how that channel account manager is doing. Because we've had numerous examples where, you know, we had a really, really good account manager and then they get promoted into some other role and all of a sudden the relationship dies because you have the wrong person in there. Uh, and that happens a lot, or it gets approved the other way too. You have a bad person in there, you bring somebody else in, and it works great. So, as, as a leader in the organization, you definitely want to reach out to guys like me and say, "Hey, how's it going? Uh, is Johnny taking good care of you?" And they'll give you on, they'll give you that honest feedback. Sure will. Yeah, so I, I would say that money isn't everything in channels. It is, it is what makes everything work. 
but at the same time, it's a very relationship driven business. So uh, you got to remember that. That's, so it's not all about sales and being success. It's also about the relationship between the individuals that are working together uh, as well. So I, I would hey, say don't hey, forget that. We've known each other for 20 years. Like we're a good testimonial to that. Exactly. And if Laura Stewart were on here, who was supposed to do it, she was also a channel partner of mine and in HTG and the whole thing. So they just all come right together. Small um, world. It's a very small world. Absolutely. So uh, just uh, q and if you have any questions, uh, please put it in there. I've had a lot of a lot of different questions that uh, you know, I kind of answered already as we were going through here, because I knew we were coming up on the time. So uh, special offers, it was SAS Max, we really do work on Ideal Partner Insights and how to identify those very early on or within your uh, larger ecosystems where you have a lot of partners that, you know, 85, you know, that, that whole 15, 20 row or 10, 10, 90 row <laughs> that a lot of them have out there. Uh, there's a lot you, uh, and Laz, you've seen a lot of time, there's a lot that really sophisticated channel programs don't know about the majority of their partners. And we're there to help you with those insights and to make sure you're identifying those partners up front or within your existing uh, ecosystem. So our special offer is, you know, hey, we'll profile 20 of your partners and we'll provide you a data-driven, uh, some data-driven insights, insights and some actual insights there. Uh, from our partner optimizer engine. Um, Zip, uh, go ahead, uh, Laz. Yeah, if you're wondering how good you are at running your channel, whether it's sales, whether it's mar marketing, uh, go to that link right there for a free channel assessment. Uh, what we'll do is we'll actually assess your program based on the answers you provide and then set up a follow up call and have a nice little roadmap of the things you should focus on. Great, great. And Stuart, I know you were thinking about something for a special offer, and, and obviously I think a lot of your customers are the, the solution providers themselves, but what what do you have, uh, would you like to offer here today, anything? Well, so, so Clint, I got, yeah, you're right, I got thinking about this, and actually one thing that did pop in my mind, we run a podcast called the Digital Nomad Podcast, where we interview uh, people in the industry, and, uh, and then we have an audience of about 10,000 solution providers globally that uh, check out our content uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, so my offer to you, if you're interested in uh, in tapping into that audience uh, from the vendor channel partner perspective, uh, my email is there, shoot me an email and uh, we'll have a conversation and see what we can do. And you know, we can also host uh, events like this with your partners and teach them from my side as a, as a vendor, uh, a channel partner, on, you know, how do we engage with your organization? So we can do that uh, as well as a group uh, education. Just reach out to me and we'll be more happy to have a conversation. Great, fantastic. So when you're ready to amplify your channel sales, reach out to us, uh, reach out to Laz, reach out to uh, Stuart. And uh, we're all here. We, we love having these conversations. We love talking to folks and, and helping them with their channel programs after years and years of experience. So I want to thank everyone here, Laz, Great meeting you. I, I'm surprised we haven't met each other. I think I've known of you in the channel, but as small as it really is, I thought I'd have met you by now. But uh, it's really great meeting you. And uh, excellent seeing you again. And if you're over in Canton, uh, we should try maybe try and get together if you if you're available. Give me a call. I'm here till Sunday. Okay. Great, great. Great sharing right with well. you guys. Nice, nice working with you, Stuart. I got to work with the digital nomad. Whoa. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. We'll have All our right. slides and everything out to you. Bye-bye.